We now know of over 5,000 exoplanets, planets that are in orbit around other stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. But the majority of those exoplanets have been found in orbit around normal stars, stars that are in their normal life stage of fusing hydrogen into helium to produce light and heat. But one of the biggest questions that we still have about planets is if they can survive when their star dies. So when a star like the sun runs out of hydrogen to fuse into helium, it'll try to delay the inevitable and start fusing helium into heavier elements. And in doing so, it will swell up into what's known as a red giant, way out past the orbit of Earth, maybe even to the orbit of Mars. When there's not enough energy left to fuse together those heavier elements though, is when the outer layers of that red giant star sun will fizzle away and leave behind what's known as a white dwarf in the center. The core of the sun that's glowing with any residual heat. Now, Earth is not likely to survive that process when it happens in about five billion years time, so nothing to worry about. But what about the gas giants like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune? Well, according to the maths of our theories and our simulations, we think so. Yeah, they should survive it. But proving that is a little bit difficult because finding planets in orbit around white dwarfs is really hard. Planets themselves don't give out any visible light. They just reflect their star's light back. And white dwarfs themselves are very faint in visible light, so there's not much of that light in the first place for any planets that might be in orbit around them to reflect. But if you look in infrared light instead, the white dwarf stars are much brighter because they're glowing with that residual heat. And so they're easier to spot. And then there's more infrared light for the planets to then be able to reflect, making the planets easier to spot as well. So this is where the James Webb Space Telescope comes in. It detects light in the infrared and it's big. So the bigger the telescope, the smaller the thing is that you can resolve on the sky. So if there are any planets in orbit around white dwarfs, as long as they're far enough away from the white dwarf, JWST should be able to separate those two objects, the light from them, the star's light and the planet's light. Plus it's also incredibly sensitive JWST. So not only can it detect the bright starlight, but also the reflected light off the planet, which is often around about 200 times fainter. So that's always been the plan with JWST in order to be able to answer this question of whether planets can survive when a star dies and leaves behind a white dwarf. The problem is you've got to find them first. So Malalian collaborators proposed to do this with JWST in its first year of observations. Use the MIRI instrument on board to take images of the four youngest and nearest known white dwarfs and just see if there was any evidence for planets orbiting around them. Now those observations were done back in early 2023 and now they've published their findings announcing the discovery of two new candidate exoplanets one around the white dwarf WD1202232 and one around the white dwarf 210582. Now there's a couple of different methods for finding exoplanets. I've talked about these before in my previous video on like the history of exoplanets. If you wanna check that out, I'll link it in the video description down below. But here with JWST, they used a technique called direct imaging. Now this is not new. It's something that the Hubble Space Telescope has done many times before with massive planets around nearby stars. But thanks to JWST, because it looks in infrared light, because it is so big, so it has the resolving power and its sensitivity. This is the first time that exoplanets have been and directly imaged around white dwarf stars. So that's what you're seeing here, these direct images. But because the planets are so faint compared to the white dwarf, it's actually easier to see them when you fit a model to the white dwarf's light in the center and then subtract that from the image. Then you can see sort of like this little smudge of the planet, which again, you can fit a model for its light and subtract it and see that detection disappear. That's really important because it shows that the light is behaving how you would expect it to when reflecting off like at the circular disk of a planet, rather than being sort of like a smudge of a distant galaxy in the background, which would have a completely different shape. You can do the same for the other exoplanet that's been directly imaged as well. It's actually a little 
harder to see this one because it's orbiting that much closer to its star. It's only when you do the subtraction of the star's light do you actually really notice it. Now these are still labeled as exoplanet candidates for now. They're not confirmed exoplanets. And that's because we only have one observation. What you need to do is go back and observe them with Miri on JWST again to see if they're still there, but also have they moved a little bit along their orbit as you'd expect. This is how the first exoplanet, which was directly imaged using the Hubble Space Telescope was confirmed. You can see it really clearly here, how we've watched it move along its orbit in the past 20 years. For now though, with these new exoplanet candidates, all we really have are the statistics from the images that say that there's a one in 3000 chance that essentially this could be not an exoplanet and is actually just a distant object, like a galaxy that's photobombing the image. Probability is quite low though, and it is above the threshold that they need to claim a detection. From the images, you can also work out roughly how big these planets are, like from how much light they're reflecting. Now that is a bit uncertain because of how faint they are, but Millennium collaborators reckon they're between about one to seven times the mass of Jupiter. Plus you can also easily measure how far out from their star these planets are actually orbiting. So one orbits at a distance of 11.5 times the Earth's sun distance, and the other 34 4.5 times the Earth-Sun distance, which is similar to sort of like Saturn and Neptune's positions in the solar system. So the discovery of these two planets by Mulaney and collaborators suggests that the outer planets of the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, will all survive when the sun runs out of fuel in five billion years and will be left to orbit a white dwarf that will slowly cool, go dark, and plunge the remnants of the solar system into complete darkness. And on that cheery note, and before we get to the bloopers, this research would not have been possible if it weren't for code. Programs that you can write yourself to do that subtraction of the star's light from the image to reveal the planet. So if perhaps you're now inspired to learn how to code, then why don't you check out Brilliant, the sponsors of this week's video. Brilliant is a website and an app that gets you to learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons across science, maths, and data science on the basics to advanced topics with new lessons added every month. Look, interactive learning has been shown to be six times more effective than passive learning, like watching videos of lectures on YouTube. Plus Brilliant's bite-sized lessons make it easy to build a daily learning habit. And one of the main pieces of advice I give to anyone that says that they wanna become a scientist, not just an astrophysicist, but any scientist is to learn how to code, which can be so overwhelming at first. But Brilliant's Thinking in Code course is great. It breaks it down into manageable chunks and what's more gets you to the good stuff quicker with this drag and drop coding so that you're not bogged down with syntax errors, which are soul destroying when you're first learning how to code. So so to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky or click on that link in the video description below and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant again for continuing to support this channel and now roll those bloopers. Like if planets do survive the star dying like that, then we should be able to spot them. Easy. Right? Like, what? Like it's hard? What? Like it's hard? Those observations were done in early 2023, and now, finally, millennium That makes it sound like, finally, God, it took you guys long enough. No. Good science takes a long time. <laughs> they took as long as they needed to, to understand the data and do this. Ugh. Science projects take, like, way longer than you always think it would. I always say to students, like, however long you think it's going to take you, like, triple it. And then I always kind of think by the time you're a postdoc, you only have to double it, but <laughs> still it always takes you longer than you think. And you can see it really clearly here. And you can see it really clearly on that image, on that image. And you can, re and you can see it. And you can see that really clearly here. Like we've watched it move along its, oh, <laughs> sorry, that was, that was a bit too cow coded. <laughs> I didn't do move again. I was just trying to like express the excitement, like physically watching something move along its orbit over 20 years. That's cool. <laughs>